Well, good morning and welcome once more to Virtual Church, 2nd of February. Great to have you with us. Hope you enjoyed our service this weekend from St Michael's where we celebrated Candlemas. And many thanks to all of you who participated uh, in the Archbishop's Call to Prayer starting last night at 6pm and really ongoing throughout the pandemic as we've been called to pray for the nation at that time. So thanks for joining in, uh, those who are able to do that. We're continuing our thoughts with Isaiah today, and we've come to another one of the servant songs, songs about this mysterious figure that Isaiah pro prophesies. He predicts that this figure is going to arise and do something to save his people. And it gradually emerges in the course of the four servant songs what it is that God is going to do. And this is the third one. I'm in Isaiah chapter 50, and I'm starting at verse 4, which says this, The Sovereign Lord has given me an instructed tongue to know the word that sustains the weary. He wakens me morning by morning. He wakens my ear to listen like one being taught. The Sovereign Lord has opened my ears, and I've not been rebellious. I have not drawn back. I offered my back to those who beat me, my cheeks to those who pulled out my beard. I did not hide my face from mocking and spitting. Because the Sovereign Lord helps me, I will not be disgraced. Therefore have I set my face like flint, and I know... I will not be put to shame. He who vindicates me is near. Who then will bring charges against me? Let us face each other. Who is my accuser? Let him confront me. It is the Sovereign Lord who helps me. Who is he who will condemn me? They will all wear out like a garment. The moths will eat them up. Who among you fears the Lord and obeys the word? Of his servant. Let him who walks in the dark, who has no light, trust in the name of the Lord and rely on his God. I love that opening verse. Do you? The Sovereign Lord has given me an instructed tongue to know the word that sustains the weary. And if we're right in saying this suffering servant is Jesus, then that's him, isn't it? Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden. I love that verse, particularly now when it's so easy to become weary, when we're slogging on through this pandemic and it's no fun, uh, is it? And we get tired. Jesus knows the word to sustain us and to lift us up. So that's what he, do what he did and keep listening to him and to what he has to say to us so that he can sustain us and carry us forward. Well, so is that a reflection of Jesus? He wakens me morning by morning to listen like one being taught. We know that Jesus had a very rich prayer life. We read one or two accounts in the Gospels where they get up in the morning, Jesus is gone. And they look about, where's he got to? And they discover he's gone off to pray, to seek his Father, to listen to God, to find out about his calling for that day and what his father wants him to do. Then it says that he hasn't been rebellious. He's not drawn back. Jesus coming to obey his father, to express his father's mission, to fulfill the destiny that the father has put before him. And we read of this, for example, when we see Jesus setting his face to go to Jerusalem, even though he knows, because he's told the disciples this is going to happen, that he'll be rejected there. He'll be put on trial and he'll be tortured to death on a cross and on the third day rise. So he spells this out for them, but he doesn't turn aside from his calling. He doesn't turn aside from the task that the Father in love has set before him. 
In fact, if we trace Jesus' movements, if we follow one of the Gospels, say, it's say Mark, it, it's, it, we can pick it out in other Gospels too, then every step that Jesus takes from the time of his transfiguration uh, leads him closer to Jerusalem and the cross, because various places get named along the way. Then he says this, I offered my back to those who beat me, my cheeks to those who pulled out my beard. I did not hide my face from mocking and spitting. And of course this reminds me, as I'm sure it does you, of the horrible time that Jesus went through when he was put on trial and then handed over to the soldiers and they they just did everything that they could think of to humiliate him by mocking, spitting, when he was on the cross. You know, that's one of the things that gets me the most when I read the stories of Jesus' suffering, because you can sort of see that the cross has a point, that it's about bearing our sins, but the, the sheer meaningless desire to hurt and humiliate uh, that is put on Jesus shows us human beings in a very bad light. Why do we rejoice in having someone to put down on, someone who's helpless? When they're down, we give them a kicking. That's, that's something that we do. And that was done to Jesus as part of the way that he walked. They beat me. They pulled out my beard. They mocked. They spit, spat on me. Uh, all those things that we know happened to him. It's interesting about this particular servant song that it's not written as, and the servant will do this, he will do that, and then he will do that. It's all done as me. I will go through this. It's all internalized and presented to us in terms of personal experience and personal feeling. Jesus enduring all of this to fulfill God's will and rescue us. And that we're going to come next to the most profound servant song of all, the fourth one, which goes into even greater detail about uh, the suffering that Jesus went through. But it's also going to go into the reasons why and what it was exactly that he was taking on himself when he took on all this suffering and pain. But let's just remember this at least, as we uh, think of these verses, that when we go through suffering, and when we have hard times, Jesus has been there. Even when it's apparently meaningless, the soldiers humiliating Jesus and just uh, hitting him randomly, um, that was meaningless. That just came out of the nastiness that has no point and no meaning. And he bore that. He took that for us. And then he gets into a bit of a, a courtroom situation. He says, I'm, I'm setting my face like flint, just like I'm, I won't uh, draw back from God's will. I, but I know I won't be disgraced. I know I won't be put to shame. And then he says this, he who vindicates me is near. Who then will bring charges against me? Let us face each other. Who is my accuser? Let him confront me. It's the sovereign Lord who helps me. It is he, uh, sorry, who is he who will condemn me? Do those ring a bell? If you're um, a fan of Romans chapter 8, and I know very many Christians who are, because it's so full of encouragements, well, the Apostle Paul's quoting these verses from Isaiah, isn't he? Yet again, we find Isaiah reflected in the New Testament. So who can bring any charge against God's elect? It's God who's for us. Who will condemn us? You know, um, so uh, that's a direct quote from Isaiah. And the Apostle Paul is drawing his in, uh, inspiration from what was his Bible, his scriptures, the law and the prophets, and the prophet Isaiah. So this, of course, puts Jesus in that courtroom situation 
where he's put on trial for his life. And although he refuses to say anything to his accusers, he's silent. He just takes it all. Uh, but that's because he knows the sovereign Lord will help him. He who vindicates me is near. Jesus is looking beyond the fake trial. Uh, he knows he'll be found innocent. They didn't find any charges against him. It's all trumped up. Uh, there was no proper criminal uh, sentence passed because they couldn't find anything he'd done wrong. Uh, they had to make it up in order to get him, which was their only intention. But he who vindicates me is near. Jesus knows that though he's going to pass through this suffering, he will be vindicated by the resurrection uh, in the time to come. So um, this then gives us a glimpse into the mind of Jesus, even in his appearance, actually. I think this is the only verse of scripture that suggests that Jesus had a beard, other than his, his general coming under the Old Testament law, which told people not to trim uh, their beards. So um, one of the very, very few hints we have anywhere in scripture as to what he looks like, but also about what he thought, what he's trying to achieve. And that will be unfolded even more in the next Servant Song that we come to look at uh, in virtual church this week. So um, just one final thing to say about this passage. Four times it uses the phrase the Sovereign Lord. This might all look like a ghastly, horrible mistake. It look, might look like a surrender to all that is nasty and uh, yet it's the sovereign Lord who is working out his purposes through it. It's a very powerful expression. It's Adonai, uh, which is the Lord, and then the holy name for God that was revealed to Moses at the burning bush, the one that was so holy that the um, uh, Israelites most of the time weren't even allowed to say it. This is, this is the Lord God doing this. That even when things look terrible, when there's a fake trial, when there are people doing horrible things, when we're weary, the Sovereign Lord is still in charge. He hasn't let us go. Shall we pray? Dear Lord, it's hard for us to imagine all that you went through in that terrible episode of your rejection and humiliation. Thank you for going through such things, such deep, painful things for us. Please, Lord, be near to us as we go through our own time of trial at the moment. Especially those who are anxious, who are lonely, who are downcast, and who are ill. And please, dear Lord, sustain us when you are weary, when we are weary by your loving word. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. So the Lord go with you and be your shelter and your strong tower. And see you next time. Bye for now.